Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We're coming to you from Waikiki Beach. Please pray for us here. We're trying to establish a Catholic radio station here in Honolulu. So pray for a miracle. Uh, today we have as our co-adventure guide, Mike Aquilina. He's the guest I have on my show more than anyone. And uh, he's written a new book, uh, How the Fathers Read the Bible. So we're going to take a kind of a journey with Mike today and uh, looking forward to that conversation. It's, slow down and just really see where the, how the primitive church read scripture. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, my returning to the Catholic faith, uh, I never really had left the Lord, but I, uh, I, had le- I had had a powerful conversion experience when I was 19. And, uh, but I wasn't really surrounded by Catholics, and so over time I drifted into Protestantism because those were the people that I knew that were, were love God and were going deeper with the Lord. But in time, um, you know, the new catechism came out, and, like, uh, and, then I, and then I was introduced to the early church fathers. And of course, the, early catech- the new catechism is just steeped in the writings of the early church fathers, and it was because of the early church fathers that I returned to the Catholic Church. And I just remember when I was at Baylor University, a beautiful Baptist university, praise God for all those strong Christians there. There's a lot of Catholics there too, by the way. I met someone once and uh, he was in a Bible study that I was in and I go, so what are you studying? He goes, well, I'm getting my master's degrees in patristics. And I go, well, what's that? And he goes, oh, it's the writing of the early church. And I go, I'm thinking like, dude, why don't you just read the Bible, you know, or, or maybe something uh, a more recent author wrote who's smarter. <laughs> You know, but it was because of my dad uh, introducing me to the liturgy of the hour uh, and beginning to have that discipline in my life that I began to discover that in there these writing of these old guys, you know, these old the, the saints and uh, men and women, but uh, a lot of the early church fathers, and then uh, uh, reading uh, uh, Crossing the Tiber uh, uh, made a big but a big effect on my life too. But it really was truly. Uh, discovering the primitive church that brought me back to the Catholic Church because I discovered in their writings that their mindset was the same mind that I had learned as a child. In fact, especially uh, the writings of uh, of Justin Martyr about the Mass. Uh, it just that that was the turning point. That was the pivot point when I read that. And so we have us. Our, our, and you know, I used to I used to sit down at the beach back in the day. You used to be able to have a cigar down at the beach here in Waikiki. Now you can sm- uh, smoke. Pacalolo or marijuana, but don't get caught with a cigar down there. But I would sit down there at night with a cigar and uh, with an iPad, and I would read through the early church fathers. And people would text me and say, so what you up to? And I go, I'm hanging out with some friends. Well, who? Oh, Justin Martyr or Athanasius or Augustine, you know. And it just, it just really felt like I was surrounded by them. And uh, when we have our guest Mike Aquilina here, uh, he is surrounded by his friends. If you uh, are watching this on our YouTube version, there's books all around you, Mike. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back, Bear. Yeah, there, I got I got the fathers all all over my office in front of me too. You can't see what's in front uh, of me, but be, they're, they're right there too. And there, and I always have this vision when I see Mike, you guys, of, of of someday someone coming in and just tipping over one of these shelves and then falling <laughs> like dominoes. And then Mike's like, "Where did Mike go? I haven't heard from Mike lately." You know, and you. <laughs> And, and here's here's the here's the end of the vision that I have for you. You're gonna be buried in all these books, and when they find you, you're gonna be reading, laying on your back <laughs> under these books. Oh, this is so a good what a one. way to go. <laughs> <laughs> but Mike, you've done something really, given us a beautiful gift. Um, Emmaus Road Publishing, in the book How the Fathers Read the Bible. I'll hold it up for you. And uh, and the subtitle is Scripture Liturgy in the Early Church. And we started off a little bit on this on our last interview. And I thought, let's come back and let's go a little bit deeper. Maybe we need more than one time together to do this. But first of all, what inspired you to write to, to write? This is your 70th book, right? Something, Something like that. It's Something the Septuagint, like that, yeah. of, it's the Septuagint <laughs> book of, of Mike Aquilina. Yes, yes. Well, what inspired me to write this one? Well, um, I, I actually got nudged by readers uh, who wanted who wanted such a book. Uh, the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology came out with a, a video series on the Bible and the Church Fathers, and it was it was enormously popular. 
But a couple people wrote to say uh, that they would like a book that just focused on that issue, how the fathers read the Bible. And so the publisher, uh, Emmaus Road Press, asked if I if I would be willing to write such a book. And of course, I'm always willing to write about the church fathers. Uh, I'm I'm like you, Bear. Uh, I I think they they make great company. And uh, yes. And, and, like you, you know, it, they brought me back to the church full force. Um, once you're once you're aware of them, it just becomes such a powerful thing oh, in your life. When you read their writings, it's like the, it's like the great homilies, you know. But you know, mm-hmm. think about think about this, Mike. Y- you're going to show up someday in heaven. They're like they're going to go. Oh, that's Athanasius. I'm going to go talk story with that dude. You know. <laughs> I mean, they're they're with us right now, and that's what I meant when I would say. Who are you hanging out with? I'm hanging out with my friends, you know. Yes. And there, there'll be that time when they're here. They're 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 praying for us, you know. They're alive and yes. they're, and they're in. The, and we will get to meet the, meet meet them someday, you know. So, uh, so um, to get to to get to, uh, mm, to have a conversation with Augustine. Guess what? You can have it. Wow. Right. Yeah. Because because it's right in his writings. Yeah. If know? he were. If, you know, someone of his stature, if, if, if he were alive today, you know, you'd probably have to apply for years to get on his calendar. He was, <laughs> oh, but I could get him on my radio show. <laughs> oh, the Bear Wozniak <laughs> That's Adventure, true. let That's me on. True. But think about this, That's C.S. True. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton and Plato oh, and yeah. Aquinas. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, hopefully, as, as the early church fathers referred to some of the early, uh, you know, the Greek philosophers as saints, uh, some of them. Uh, to to have if, I'm I'm not presuming that they're there, but to, but I think uh, who was it? Um, who was the uh, in the, in Dante's comedy? Who was the uh, the the author that brought him through the through um, Hal and Virgil. Virgil. Yeah, so he didn't quite make it, you know, into paradise. But uh, but but to to the, to be able to converse with these people, I'm just thinking G.K. Chester and C.S. Lewis and and Thomas Aquinas and Athanasius all talking stories, sitting around having cigars and a shot of whiskey, you know, in heaven. Cardinal Newman, yeah. <laughs> Cardinal, Cardinal Newman. Newman. Oh yeah, that's the the British the, the whole British connection. He so. um, yeah, Cardinal Newman had a great observation. He he just pointed out very simply that everyone who ever lived. Is still alive today, right? You know, and they're still very much with us. You know, the 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 letter to the Hebrews talks about them as a great cloud of witnesses. Yeah, so they're, they're cheer. It's like they're cheering us on well, as some we're of, finishing the race. Some of us, some of them aren't, <laughs> right? I mean, some yeah. of them are in, in hell, yeah. but but yeah. but yeah, but they're still they still exist. You know, because yeah. of the dignity God gave them as 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 creating them. But you go, you know, you think about. Uh, I, I don't want to skip ahead too much, but you think about. Uh, Justin Martyr and his great argument uh, was that this religion that he was converted to um, predates the predates Athens, predates mm-hmm. the Greek philosophers. He was a philosopher himself. He wore the mm-hmm. philosopher's robes, but it predated. Uh, yes. You know, you can't say that Christianity is a new religion because they had this take on on the old. Te- people all all knew that. That the Jewish religion was an ancient religion, and that their text yes. was was ancient, and so his reference to that ancient, uh, the ancient writings, and how they portended, you know, or for, or, or, or told, spoke about Jesus. Maybe I'm jumping ahead. Why don't we stay? Why don't we stay in, in the same sequence as your book? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, the first apostolic fathers. There's two Clements. The first one you mentioned, though, is the Clement of Rome, who's mentioned in the Bible, right? And he was well, good. yes, he may be. In the letter to the Philippians, Paul mentions a Clement who's with him in Rome. And, uh, you know, it's, it seems quite likely that that would be the Clement uh, who succeeded Paul and Peter um, as, as head of the, of the Church of Rome. Uh, Clement was likely the first pope after St. Peter. And, uh, and, and, and from his letter, we can see the concerns of the Church in the middle of the first century. Isn't that cool? Yeah, he you was know, right. Like, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mike. Like we have a window thrown open on that first century. He was writing perhaps as early as 67 AD. You know, uh, some scholars place him later, like 97 AD. But no matter which one is right, no matter which party is right, we're talking about very early in the church's history. We're talking about someone who was in contact with the apostles. And he was he was kind of. He was writing to the to the Corinthians, saying, "Don't you remember? Well, this is cool. You make a point about this in the book." He was writing to the Corinthians and correcting them, mm-hmm. but that that meant also that they that they uh, looked to him as a father. 
you yes. know, th that he had the right to do that. But he quoted Paul. So already Paul's letters were both in Corinth, but also in Rome, that those letters were being shared and respected as not necessarily canonized yet, but as being from, from the Lord. You're right. Uh, you know, the, the fact that he was writing a letter of reproof to a, to a church across the ocean uh, yeah. you know, shows that there was a, a certain authority resident in Rome at that time in the first in the first pope after St. Peter himself. Uh, it's very interesting that um, that someone writing that early in the church's history already assumes that St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians are scripture, that the yes. Corinthians knew those things and they could be invoked as uh, as as uh, as authoritative texts. Uh, because he has some, he has a bone to pick with them. You know, they're 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 acting in a prideful way. They're not um, they're not uh, obeying their own local authorities. So he has to step in. They're rebelling uh, in against defense. their their presbyters. That's right. That's right. So he's saying that some of those things that Saint Paul uh, uh, rebuked you for a generation ago, they're just surging up again because well, of pride. There was kind of that 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 thing though in in the Greek world, of argument arguing you know like uh, you think about Athens that they would what was the rock they all the uh, uh, the Areopagus yeah the Areopagus where they would all stand on that big huge rock and they would argue and so yes. it was kind of like let's argue you know um, you know this religion I have this thought yeah. you have that thought and uh, and that that and that caused division and it didn't uh, and, and them rising up against the priests but Clement wrote to them as a as a loving father but then was it also very free to rebuke to, to correct them yes and what what you know what his letter shows is that is the way the church invoked scripture as an authority okay so he's already talking about saint paul's letters but mostly he's talking about the old testament he walks through old testament history showing that there's a certain order to be observed in the people of god it's not anarchy you can't just impose your rules on it that there are rules uh, that were observed by the people of God in the Old Testament and they still do apply in the New Testament there are structures of authority that have to be kept uh, unless uh, unless you're you know and if you don't keep them you descend into anarchy yeah in, in, in today's world so many um, are uh, oppose the Pope but then they become their own Pope yes yes and uh, and you know that's what happened there in Corinth they didn't like the uh, the presbyters and the way they were they were running the church and so what did they do they appointed new presbyters we'll find people who agree with us and we'll appoint them as the clergy but, in but, our but, church so and that was the that was the the presbyters of course are the priests but but mm -hmm. that's not the way it was in the early church the early church was all love and everything was just <laughs> you know we're talking with Mike Aquilina his book. Uh, how the Fathers read the, the Bible, Scripture, Liturgy, and the Early Church. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Dan Laboon Markham with another episode of Country Up, Spittin' and Whittlin'. A lad back in the 1950s, I would sit with my kin working their rocking chairs on the back porch of the old Markham home. It was a two-story affair, having a large dining room where the grandfather clock chimed in dinner and other affairs. It was built back in the 1870s after my great-uncles, grandpappy and great-grandpappy came across the Oregon Trail to strike it rich in the booming and sometimes bust salmon fishing industry. The old place was blown off its foundation during the Columbus Day storm of 1962. Hooey, that was one serious southwester with gusts of over 100 miles per hour and sustained winds of 80 to 90 miles per hour. Well, I digress, but digressing is a fine place to go now and then. Anywho, great uncle Hiram and Joseph would sit on the back porch of the old place spitting and whittling tobacco juice, that is, telling their stories after Sunday church dinner. And that's when most of the spitting and whittling was done. It was a for sure event to happen every week. Having a good stick or a piece of driftwood and carving knife was required. Time passed as stories got told. Jesus was a master storyteller. What them parables are all about. Spiritual truth wrapped in a story. I can picture Jesus with his twelve around a campfire or sitting in the shade of a green tree in Galilee, pointing out to the surrounding fields. Behold, the lilies of the field. Yep finest stories in the world to be reading. 
If you haven't picked up the Bible lately, open up to the storybooks of the Bible, like Genesis, Exodus, Esther, and the Gospels and the Book of Acts. Some real interest in reading and storytelling at its best. This is Dan Laboon Markham at CountryUp.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our guy today is my good friend. I love this guy so much, Mike Aquilina. Uh, you know, Mike, we were, uh, uh, there was a priest in, uh, in uh, Melbourne, uh, I guess in the Atlantic, Florida. He was associate pastor there. Now he has his own church. And I believe his name is Father Jerome, but I could be mistaken. But his conversion was, he was, he was, a, uh, he was converted as a young man uh, in the Assembly of God area and a great evangelist and brought many, many people to the Lord. Uh, and then uh, while he was going to school, they said, listen, why don't you do a study this summer for the church on how the early church uh, worshipped? And so, of course, where did he go? He went to the early church fathers, I mean, where he thought he was going to see people doing Pentecostal-type things. Um, and, of course, the early church did because it was a, it was a uh, the movement of the Holy Spirit was alive and well, of course. But he started to find that it was a liturgical church. And that uh, that there was this this order of the church, the reading of the word and the and the celebration of the Eucharist. You were saying uh, that how the early church, uh, the readings of the people heard the scriptures in a liturgical format. Yes, yes, and that that's really the premise of my book that that the scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, were composed in order to be read aloud, in order to be recited and heard in the context of, of the assembly, the liturgical assembly, where, where the people of God met for their ritual public worship. Uh, that's true in the Old Testament as well as the New. We, we see in the Old Testament many instances of this kind of proclamation. The time of Josiah, the time of Nehemiah, you know, the vivid one that I like is, is Moses. You know, he's, mm. he's proclaiming the scriptures in the context of sacrificial worship when he mm. receives the law from God. Oh, okay. So, and, and then, of course, I love Nehemiah. I love the story of Nehemiah and uh, them re rereading the, the scriptures. I just I, I love I, I love the fact that uh, it was men and their families that rebuilt the walls. But I guess that's another another uh, another time uh, to, to go into that. But but from the ancient of times, the passing down, even before Moses, it was orally shared around the campfire. I mean, people yes. memorized these words. The first five books of the Bible were People didn't have scrolls for the most yeah. part. They were they were campfire stories that they memorized. Here in Hawaii, we have the tradition of the hula, and the hula is storytelling, and so the same words and the same motions, especially the ancient form of of the hula, the kahuku, it's telling the oral tradition of the Hawaiian people, the the, the wars, the beautiful places that they lived, and things like that. But it was like that. That was their scripture started out as campfire stories only memorize you know yes and the way you commit these things to memory is by is by recitation and repetition and and the time when you recite and the time when you repeat these things is is during sacrificial worship you know th when you're offering yes. sacrifice to god and so uh, the the scriptures were composed in order to be part of the liturgy and that's implicit in the scripture whenever it's not explicit you know as in the time of in the stories of moses and 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 uh, josiah and nehemiah in the new testament you know we find the same thing what does our lord do you know he he goes into the synagogue on the sabbath where there is the the rights of of 
of of every Saturday. You know, there it's it's a liturgy, and he goes and he takes the scroll and he reads it, puts it down, and then he comments upon it. Right. So it's just as we have today the recitation of the scriptures, the proclamation of the scriptures, and then it it's followed by the homily. Our Lord is showing us how that goes, and and we find that that um, that often throughout the New Testament that there's a certain order to worship, and this involves you know the proclamation of the Word of God. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit uh, more to the to the next uh, of the fathers that you bring up. Another man that's probably in Scripture. I think Barnabas would be someone I would like to hang out with because. If he could bring John Mark back with him to uh, to continue on a, an apostolic journey, maybe I could pass the mustard. Maybe he, I would be acceptable to him, too. Well, he was called the son of encouragement. Yeah, that's what his name means, right? Oh, okay. I didn't know that was mm -hmm. his actual name. Okay, well, tell us about uh, his early writings. Well, we have this one letter that's attributed to him from the first century, and we don't know whether it was attributed in honor of him or um, or whether he actually wrote it. It's not in Scripture, so we don't... Um, we don't uh, honor it the same way we honor the books of Scripture, but it's very helpful for us if we want to understand historically uh, how the early earliest Christians interpreted the Old Testament, uh -huh. because he's very clear on on one thing, that all of the Old Testament points forward to Christ, that all of that history was leading us to the Messiah, that that the the New Testament is already there concealed in the old testament and the old testament then is revealed in the new testament this um this becomes uh, a key to understanding the scriptures that's that's used by all the church fathers they all turn that key in the course of their commentary and, and in the it, course of their preaching. And, and jesus put that key right inside that lock uh in his life yes. but especially i think uh on the road to emmaus oh yes yes you know he's always either quoting the the books of the hebrew scriptures or he's um he's he's alluding to them so so much of the new testament is 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 just referring back to the old testament and as you said when he's there at emmaus we we find that he's drawing from all the scriptures in order to show how he's there implicit in all of those scriptures all the, so okay. they all point toward him well let me ask you about that in the septuagint is the book of sirach and the book of wisdom there yes yes the, and so, the books that Go ahead, Mike. Uh, the books, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the books that we call the Deuterocanonicals, uh, the second canon, so to speak. Uh, they are all there in uh, in in the Septuagint, which is which is the earliest Greek translation of sacred scripture that we know of. And there were other Greek translations later, but that's the earliest one. I love that, especially when it comes to you and your Septuagint of books. But isn't that the book that Jesus quoted, or the New Testament quotes? The New Testament quotes the Septuagint. Yes. Why? Why yes. are why are those uh, some of those books rejected then by Martin Luther? That's an interesting question because Saint Jerome came to believe uh, in the authority of a later translation uh, and uh, the the authority of. Uh, of the Hebrew edition that was current during his lifetime, which was the fifth century. Okay, so he he um, he believed that the, the that the the Hebrew scriptures, as they were uh, they were kept then by Jews, ah. were the Hebrew scriptures that were kept in the first century and were authoritative in the first century, and so uh, Jerome privileged that that um, that 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 Jewish text, um, which he thought was earlier. Uh, but but may not have been earlier. Right. You know, it it may actually have been a later uh, edited version of the sacred scriptures um, that that was that that was done uh, deliberately uh, as an anti-Christian edition. It, it's so interesting because in, the, in the, the Hebrews of that day in Jerusalem, they probably spoke the, the, at least the scholars all spoke in Greek. Of course, there was Latin there, too. The Septuagint was translated. Where was it in Alexandria? Well, yes, tell, tell, Egypt, tell us the yes. story of the Septuagint. Well, the, the, you know, the, the Septuagint comes from the, the, the Greek word for 70. And, uh, and the story goes that there were 70 or 72, uh, depending on the version you read, uh, that there were, there were 70 translators who set about translating uh, the books of the Hebrew Scripture into Greek at the request of the Greek king of Egypt. And so they set about translating them all at the same time, and they all produced exactly the same translation. Now, this was hailed they, as a great miracle. They were isolated in 70 different cells. 
Yes. And Justin Martyr said he actually visited those cells. He knows they That's exist. right. He said, he said, this isn't a fable. This really happened. Yes. He, it was a tourist attraction in his day. <laughs> You know, they kept those cells uh, so they could show people. Um, so, so yes, this this became an authoritative text for Jews who were living in the dispersion, in the diaspora, in Greek cities throughout the known world, uh, because this became the common text. Greek was the common language of all people living in those cities. And so the Jews who grew up in the diaspora became more familiar with Greek with, than they, they, they were with the, with the original Hebrew. The first few hundred years of the church, it was a Greek, it was, all the great thinkers wrote in Greek, in Greek. and of course the New Testament was, was uh, writ, written in Greek, so we have to kind of, but yet here it is in, Nor, uh, in Egypt, uh, where you have this, this, this Septuagint, and if it's a, what the New Testament quoted, I think probably the church when it canonized the the you know the book of wisdom and the book of Sirach and and those books the Maccabees that that if if it was good enough for the New Testament to quote it's good enough for us to include in the Old Testament even though Martin Luther uh, removed them well let, let's talk for a second about one of my well you know my favorite per people there came a there came a point really quickly in the church we see it with with Paul um, debating uh, about uh, the the Judaizers who wanted people to be to follow all the law in, as in order to be saved. When we come right back, we're going to be talking about Justin Martyr. I just just the name itself is just so cool. It and is. he was he was one of the what you call the fighters, the apologists who fought for the faith. And we'll talk. We'll come back talking with Mike Aquilina in his book. Listen, you got to know the early church fathers if you like a good Western writing. If you like cowboy movies. Read these stories about the early father, because these guys were all cowboys. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak from DeepAdventure.com. I remember once I was interviewing the surfing priest, Father Don Calloway, and I said, Father, when you come in after a great session, you've ridden some really great waves, do your friends come up to you and say, man, you were awesome, or do they say, man, those waves were awesome? Surfers get credit to the waves. Uh, we, uh, what, one of the beautiful things about a surfer is when he surfs a wave, it tends to reveal the power and the beauty of the wave. When it's big and, you're, and people are surfing a half a mile or a quarter of a mile out, it's hard to even see how big that wave is. But when a surfer drops in, and you may not even see him because he's so far out, but you see that white ribbon, the thread of him surfing down the face of that wave, uh, it shows you how big and how powerful and how awesome and how beautiful that wave is. Even though you really don't see the surfer, you see the result of his carving down the wave. We give glory to the wave. That's where we as Christians receive our power, is the power of the Holy Spirit. And a surfer knows, I've dropped in on really big waves and done the bottom turn and just go shooting down the line and I'll get so far out in front of that wave that I lose the power and I have to carve and cut back and get into the power. Sometimes you begin in the spirit and end in the flesh. There's a great move of the Lord in your life, but then you say, oh, I've got this, God, and you just keep going on in your own strength. No, God wants you to always come back, always come back to that central power of the wave, to the central uh, presence of Jesus in your life and the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the ultimate experience of a surfer is to drop in and have the barrel cover over you, where you're totally hidden inside the barrel. And believe me in there, it's loud and it's powerful and it's the greatest experience of life. To be hidden in Christ is even greater. To be able to drop in and when people see you coming in your ministry and in your love and the way you live your life, they forget you're even there and they see Jesus. Be hidden in Christ. This is Bear Wozniak deepadventure.com You can gain traction in the virtues in my book Deep Adventure The Way of Heroic Virtue and you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book A Surfing Guide to the Soul both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak DeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, 
And since I'm a Benedictine Oblate, we have the St. Benedict Exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too. Plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, we're here with uh, Mike Aquilina. I'm supposed to give you all kinds of promos to go to our website, deepadventure.com. Sophia Institute just came out with two of my books, uh, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, and then a really, really, actually a really cool book, A Surfer's Guide to the Soul, which actually is follows uh, uses uh, my life in surfing, but also follows the Carmelite spirituality. So it's kind of a cool way to kind of introduce people that might not otherwise pick up a book. I remember when I first wrote that book, Mike. I was, uh, I got my book. You know how you know how when you get your book, you smell it. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Uh, so, so I, my my literary manager said, "Be sure to smell it." And I jumped on an airplane to go do a book tour. So I never even got to read my new book. And I'm sitting on the airplane. And I just opened it up. I'm about to write it and read it. And the guy next to me goes, "What are you reading?" And I go, "Well, it's my new book. I just came out." And he goes, "Well, can I can I take a look at it?" And the whole flight to the mainland, he read the whole book. He didn't get up to go to the That's bathroom. That's cool. He didn't get up to go to the bathroom once. So if someone likes it that much, but it's a good book. But I will talk about Mike Aquilina and his book, one of his 70 books, How the Fathers Read the Church. Of course, the early church fathers. Scripture, liturgy, in the early church. And Mike, Justin Martyr, I, this guy changed. This, is the, this was the pivotal person in my life. He's a gnarly guy because he's writing <laughs> to the emperor, you know, and he's yeah. going to get martyred. But yeah. uh, it all starts out with uh, him being a philosopher. He wore the philosopher's robe, his love for Plato, but his confusion because there was such a diversity of opinion. And they love to have diversity of opinion. They like to argue. Mm -hmm. And then he was it Trifo. What was the person's name that he had the Trifo conversation? Trifo was the rabbi. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Tell us all about that. Well, you know, Justin uh, w was born and and grew up in Palestine. So he grew up very close to the sites of the biblical scenes, but he came from a pagan family. After the Jewish rebellion, uh, the Romans wanted to resettle that place with Gentiles. And so he was one of those families. And he was a seeker. Oh. He was a seeker after God. And, uh, and so he tried to find God by way of philosophy. He tried one after another school of philosophy, Aristotle and, uh, and, and, uh, and Pythagoras and, oh, okay. uh, and, and uh, the Stoics. And he was dissatisfied by every school of philosophy until he met someone who told him about the prophets of Israel. And he said, very recently, all of these oracles of the prophets have been fulfilled in this very land. And so he examined that. And he, he was converted. He was also very much influenced by the witness of the martyrs. He saw them go, going forward happy to their death. And he wanted to be happy like they were. So he became a philosopher for Jesus Christ, started walking, walking across the land until he got to Turkey, you know, and, and it was yeah. the, the lands that are now Turkey. And it's there that he met Trifo, oh, the Jew. Okay. And he had this long dialogue with him about the fulfillment of the prophecies from, from the Old Testament. Well, you know, it's it's like he did find the Lord on the beach, right? Yes, yes. And it, it, it was, he was yeah. probably a surfer. Let's just face it, you know. Yeah, right. But but it, it, you know, I, I had the experience in, in, at Baylor University of getting to be in a room with about a dozen other people with a great professor of philosophy, and that one semester I got to take this course that just crossed over all the philosophy. I don't remember a, a Augustine or Aquinas, if you would call them philosophers being included in there. But I remember going through this journey, especially when you get up to the philosophers of the of the um, so-called enlightenment. Mm -hmm. every, every one of them, even, I gotta say, even, um, you know, uh, the, the, the Plato's Republic, you know, and, or you'd read these and it would all, yeah, this sounds really, really good, but then I, they'd always kind of, to me, just miss. Well, how, how about this guy? And then we would just miss. And then I would get to the point where I would just say, I'm, I'm going to let you jump in here, then I'll finish my story because you got something you got to say. Go ahead. No, I, I, I thought I, I was I, I was just going to remark that that's a, that's a great comparison. You know, you're going through all of these guys who are more modern philosophers, but you really are just retracing the steps of Justin when he yeah. was a young man. You know, trying these out, trying them on, and finding that they don't quite fit. You know, yeah. they're, they're not. They don't quite almost. do the job. Yeah, almost. yeah, yeah. So he came to look back at them then with Christian eyes, and he had a new appreciation for them. You know, he even believed that that uh, Socrates 
was What's really anticipating yeah. Jesus Christ, right? Oh, okay. and he, yeah. he martyred for truth, right? That yeah. he was, he was, um, that that in the works of the ancient philosophers we find what he called seeds of the word. Yes, seeds of the yeah. word. That that it's like God was 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 just sowing seed all through history, and it would all come to fruition at the same time in the life of Jesus Christ. Yeah, around 500 BC, some good stuff was happening. You know, yes. in, in 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 that Greek world and great great thinking and of course we have a spiritual rational soul, but I just remember going through all of these philosophers, Mike, and finally at the end of the course, I was 19 years old, I had never had a drink, I wasn't promiscuous, I was working hard to get through college, and I just kind of thought, well, you know, drug, sex, and rock, if that's all there is, because I mm -hmm. tried Catholicism, I would go to mass and. Although I was attracted to the faith, I didn't find anything real about it. And the young priest that stood in the back of the church where I stood, you know, just outside, I'd go and get the bulletin to prove to my parents I'd gone to mass. <laughs> yeah. He was. Ta we were talking about Buddhism and all kinds of other religions. He just kind of. We was just. He was carrying me right down the wrong direction too. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so then I thought, is that all there is? And then I might as well do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I don't think I would have gone that route, but. I just felt this depression. Is that all there is? Mm -hmm. And then I was so fortunate because my mother invited me to a Catholic charismatic prayer meeting, and I had this great uh, infusion of God's love, and, and, and everything just happened for me. But I was at the kind of that end of the rope when the Lord just, I just had felt I had, and I'd also pursued martial arts for the Eastern religion part of it. And so it finally, then suddenly Jesus surprised me, you know. But Justin yeah. Martyr had done that. He had sifted through everything, but he, he had a take on the Old Testament, how it, how it pre predated Socrates. Yes, yes. And, and, he, and it's true. I mean, Justin was a smart guy. He could do history. He could make a timeline like they used to make us do in high school, right? Yeah, yeah. And he could make the timeline, and he could see that the prophets were writing before the time of Socrates, right? So he, he really did believe that, that the idea of monotheism kind of seeped out from Israel and it reached the Greeks and the Greeks were influenced by this um, so that by the time you get around to Socrates and, and Plato and Aristotle they they kind of take for granted that there is one supreme God or that there is one creator and that sort of thing they they have indistinct ideas about God but but certain things are are fundamental and they seem to go in that direction so so um so justin makes the case and other church fathers made the case as well that this was an idea of um of uh, or this was this was the product of um of hebrew ideas kind of seeping out into the culture of the lands nearby you know it, it remind, and of course in, in his day as a philosopher they would go back uh to Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, maybe a little bit further back, but they, uh, but that was as far back as they went. And I feel like in our world today, people go back to Hume, Locke, Nietzsche. Mm -hmm, you right. know, they don't go far enough back. They don't go to yes. Aquinas. You know, he's been yes. thrown out. Um, and but he went beyond those and went all the way back to saying, if the Hebrew scriptures. He also made the comment. You you talk about this, that the uh, Hebrew scriptures don't contradict themselves. The layers and layers of prophets, like when I used to drive through the mountains in the Rocky Mountains, you know, you'd see one layer of hills and hills that go on forever till they become mountains. It was like the prophets really don't contradict each other. They all had the same thing to say. Yes, yes. And it is remarkable when you think about it that this library of books that we call the Bible has retained its authority down through millennia. There is a consistency to it. It's, it's all talking about the same religion. It's all kind of promoting the same basic ideas and the same commandments and it's consistent from end to end and uh and it's remained authoritative for so many people down the down the ages i was sharing uh, this is a long time ago i was sharing with a, a jewish woman who was very the most evangelistic jewish person that i'd ever met she was really beautiful and really special and she had the patience to let me open up a book that i had that listed all the old testament prophecies and how they were fulfilled in Christ, and she became a Christian that day. Oh, wow! You know, wow. so that is that is that that truth of the Old Testament. We love. We don't reject the Old Testament. We mm -hmm. we see its fulfillment in Christ. We're talking with Mike Aquilina, and the name of the book is what, Mike? Mike, uh, the how the fathers read the Bible: Scripture, liturgy, and the early church. Scripture, liturgy, and the early church, and they can find your book where? 
Uh, well, the best place to get it is CatholicBooksDirect.com. CatholicBooksDirect.com. Uh, they usually have my, my books at the best prices. And also, Mike somehow stole the best uh, website name in the world. What is it called? FathersOfTheChurch.com. <laughs> I mean, dude, how'd you get that one? <laughs> Did you get Coca-Cola.com at the same time? <laughs> My son, my son got it, and he really, uh, yes, he did, and he gave it to me as a as a birthday present. Yep. Oh, how cool! That is. So <laughs> when he cool. was just little. He was just little. Really? Oh, yeah. Like how how little was he? Let me do the math here. Um, he was probably about uh, thirteen years old, fourteen years old. Oh, that is just uh, don't you love? It? Yeah, my my son's all so brilliant like that too. We're talking with Mike Aquilina. This is the Bear Wastic Adventure. We'll be right back. That's right. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to invite all the men to go to our website, oh, men and women, of course, and go to deepadventure.com, and you can join uh, Bear's Man Cave in the School of Manliness. And what I love about our School of Manliness is when you join, when you join the Man Cave in the School of Manliness, you're invited to twice a month Zoom meetings. One is with the whole group, and one is with your special uh, t uh, team uh, uh, that meets you know, smaller cells so you can have more uh, encouragement of each other. And then also the School of Manliness is a three-year cycle going through all these different lessons on manliness, videos, audio segments, homilies from the cowboy priest Father Bryce Lundgren and <clears throat> Daniel Markham who does our, our, our Man Up series and, and writings from me and, and the deep virtue segments from me. So each month there's, there's a curriculum and uh, you check off each one as you go, and but we go through the curriculum together. So if you start in the ninth month of year one, that's where you start with us. And so we all go through it together. But, but man, what's so cool about this is you can do this with your sons. They can have their own username and password. They can't come to the man cave because they're too young. But they can, you can lead them through a study of what manliness is uh, through that three-year cycle. You get a young man who's of confirmation age. By the time they've gone through three years, it, they'll be they'll be ready um, because they've had time with their dad and they've had a really great conversation. We're talking with uh, my good friend Mike Aquilina and his book "How the Fathers Read the Bible." We're going through the apologists uh, first, and you mentioned uh, Tertullian. What what made him different? What I mean, there's a lot, but what what was the the uh, the first thing that st stands out in your mind about Tertullian? Well, he was another one of these these apologists who explain um, and defend the faith. But he he was also a, a, a fighter. He had a pugilistic style. You know, uh, Justin was a very warm figure, very inviting. He tried to see the good in paganism, right, and point out the good things, yes. show common ground. Tertullian had no use for that kind of thing. You know, he was the one who was who was on it. You know, and he's he's just like telling telling them, you know, what's wrong with paganism and what they're going to find in Christianity uh, to make up for the lack of everything that that you find in paganism. So he's the guy who says says things like, "What has Athens to do with Jerusalem?" You know, yeah, Athens has great question. no value now, right? You know, yeah, the Greek culture, yeah. Greek culture and the philosophers have no, no value to us. And he was in, in Africa. Where in Africa was he? In Carthage. Carthage. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he was in, he was in Car Carthage, North Africa. It was the, really the, the capital city of the Roman province uh, of Africa. And it was a port city. And it had a lot of culture. It was very influential, even back in Rome. And he was a prominent lawyer, a pagan. And he converted to Christianity as an adult. And after that, he used his all his lawyerly skill in oh. defending and explaining the faith. 
and Carthage it was like just a, just a stone's throw almost from from Sicily and and wasn't that the breadbasket for Rome to some degree? It was, it was, and 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 Sicily was another one too. But but uh, but yeah, yeah, Carthage was was very prosperous and as I said, very influential. A lot of a lot of the the most influential Latin authors were there in in Roman Africa, and it's quite probable, I think, that the Latin liturgy started in not in Rome. But in Carthage, in and this North was the Africa. first real Latin uh, father that we come across. Is that right? Yes, yes. First Latin theologian. Um, you know, before that, we have a couple of Latin documents, but but not a single figure we can call a theologian. It was all Greek, and you know, when you think of Greek, it's so such a foreign place. When you go to when you go to the Greek churches, and they, it's dark yes. in there, and there's those oil lamps. You know, those big yeah. bowls of lamps, and. And these guys that look like ZZ Top or the guys from Duck <laughs> Dynasty, you know, with the long, long, long beards, you know. I don't know how much that was in in, in Alexandria, but but then you have this 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 Latin now coming forth, and his big fight, it's an interesting fight, was against the Marcionists. Mm. Yeah, well, so you as you point out, he was not only a fighter of those outside the church, but even those who were causing trouble within the church. And uh, the heretics, he was a heresiologist, and he went after them with good arguments, mostly from Scripture. So that's why he's relevant to this book, you know, and how the fathers read the Bible. Marcion threatened uh, the apostolic way of using the Old Testament. Marcion had no use whatsoever for the Old Testament. He was very anti-Jewish. And he, he wanted the Old Testament to be put away, and he wanted it even to be edited out of the New Testament. So it would be a very strange religion if, if we had followed Marcion's lead. Uh, he, he was unfortunately very wealthy, and so he was able to, to buy off a lot of people and set up his own school and have much more influence than he should have had. But Tertullian was going to go at him with the full force of his gifts, and he did. And eventually, they, you know, he, Tertullian and other fathers brought brought down Marcion. Well, his he was he, it isn't that it was just against the Old Testament. He was against the Old Testament God. Yes, yes, he thought well, that the the Old Testament had a different God from the New Testament. Right, and so give me a couple more minutes on that if you can. <laughs> well, Think, in the Old say Testament, it in two minutes, Mike. He said the Creator God, the Creator God, we see in the Old Testament, and he created matter as something evil. To trap spirits in, right? And uh, and so matter was evil, and creation was evil, and and the redeemer came into the world from outside of matter, okay? By a, a sent by a higher god in order to redeem these spirits of light who were trapped within matter. So you have two very different gods, and Tertullian and the the church fathers were were very clear on this. No, you don't do that. Going back to the principle we said before, the New Testament is concealed in the old, and the old is revealed in the new. You can't have one without the other. And we make the point as Christians to say that God loves uh, matter, and He loves yes. the human body he, yes. so much so that He, uh, you know, the the second person of the Trinity became man. That's right. And so to call the as the Gnostics often called the human body uh, evil, you know. Yes. Uh, yes. The Albigensians and and of, of later later on uh, always goes back to just the the evil of the world, the evil of the matter. But God loves it, and you know what? As Catholics, we know because we kneel and we stand and we <laughs> make the sun. Yeah, we use our right. bodies in our worship, right? With incense, all of our senses are 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 taken in with with the sights and sounds and smells of worship. Well, they probably got calisthenics as some sort of derivative of Catholicism because we <laughs> we stand, sit, kneel, stand, sit, kneel. <laughs> So we're talking with Mike Aquilina about his book, uh, How the Fathers Read the Bible. And the, the next person that you bring up is a very unique person, uh, Lactantius. He was the guy who invented, uh, talked about uh, making sure babies had breast milk. Was that what is Lactantius? <laughs> okay, bad joke, bad joke. But uh, I was trying to figure <laughs> that one out for a while there. But he was really a pivotal person. We don't hear that much about him, though. But tell us about his his uh, fight for the faith. Well, he's another one of those those Africans, right? So so they were they were tough. They were they were dogged. They were they were um, they were smart. Like Athanasius, and, uh, right? Just like Athanasius, tough, right? Tough fighters, so, so, cowboys. 
Right, right, yeah. right. So Lactantius was a guy who was very accomplished, like Tertullian. He was a rhetorician, like Tertullian, and he got the top job in the empire. You know, he was the Latin rhetorician at the court of the emperor. So he exercised a lot of influence. And he started to, to um, experiment with ideas that had never been known before, like the idea of freedom of conscience, freedom of religion. And he's floating these at the court of the emperor and during the time of persecution, when Christians are being put down. Yes, yes. So he's dangerous. raising these ideas. And event yeah, it was dangerous. So eventually he had to leave the court. Uh, but later on, you know, he became he became the tutor of, uh, of of the future emperor Constantine. So he introduced these ideas to Constantine. And when Constantine came to the throne, well, then those ideas were able to take off in a very articulate way in Constantine's writings and proclamations because he had learned them from Lactantius. And, and, and it's so interesting how many of the of these great thinkers, especially the early bishops, they're in they're they're doing their job and then they're in, in exile. I don't know. He, he kind of exiled himself. Right. I think. But mm -hmm. yes. And then they're back in their in, in their job and then they're exiled again. They're kind of it's almost yes. like uh, when you think about, uh, for example, Athanasius being t you know sent out into the desert. That's like sending uh, what was the rabbit that went out into the briar patch? I forget that old story. I mean, he was very at home in the desert. You know, like, thank oh. you. That's where he wanted to be anyway, although he needed to care for his flock, but he loved. Okay, so we, we're talking with Mike Aquilina, and this might be a good place to, to stop. We're going to talk about the explosion in Alexandria uh, when, when we visit with you on, on the next part of this series. But the name of your book, again, is I'll read it. How the Fathers Read the Bible, Scripture, Liturgy, and the Early Church. And what's the name of the website that your son got for you? Fathersofthechurch.com. Yeah, his 13-year-old son got that. And that's where you can find all of his 70 books. Maybe by the time this airs next week, there'll be 72 books. But we love Mike Aquilina. Thanks for joining us, Mike. I love you too, Bear. Thanks for having me. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. You want to do it with me? Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak DeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our DeepAdventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift.